the 40th anniversary at the Jank Center, and um, we thought that it would actually be interesting to focus on the history of the Jank Center. So um, tonight's program, I'm happy to introduce um, Rick Goldberg is a volunteer who's been working at the center, and um, I, when I met with Rick, he um, volunteered to do archiving, and that had been on the list for like 16 years, and nobody ever wanted to do it, and we were so lucky to have Rick volunteer, and he did a really um, Herculean job in going through 40 years of documentation. So what we're going to do tonight, the program will be, Rick is going to present, we have a PowerPoint presentation, which is going to present um, some factual information, historical information, dates, timeline, along with some photographs. And then afterwards, um, we have a panel, which is going to complement the presentation. And the panel consists of Jim and Carol Kent, um, Peggy and Jack Roll, and Dr. Richard Norberg. And they've all been involved either in the creation of the Jank Center or the evolution of the Jank Center. And I think that their comments um, will certainly be critical to our understanding of understanding the history of the Jenks as well as the future of the Jenks. So with that being said, thank you very much for coming. And I'd like to um, recognize and thank the board members from the Council on Aging, the Winchester Senior Association, and the Winchester Senior Association Trust. And um, I hope everybody um, finds this entertaining and informative. Rick? Good evening. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, the Jank Center is somewhat personal to me because I moved to Winchester the year after it opened. And over the years, I've been to many programs here, lectures, uh, town meetings, all kinds of activities. So digging through the history was very interesting for me. And if you have comments or questions, please hold them until the end because the panel will be able to answer them much better than I can. Before the Jank Center was here, there was a mansion. And this was owned by um, David Skillings, who were the, the street is named after him. Anyway, the interesting thing about this was he bought it from the person who first built the uh, state, a guy named David Nelson, who built it for his bride, who's named Alice Alone. She came from Calais, Maine, all the way down here. And in the summertime, nobody had air conditioning in those days. This was around the turn of the century, 1900. So he opened the windows like everybody else did. And, and he invited musical groups to come into his living room and play music. With his blessing, the neighbors and the townspeople came to this, to his front door with their blankets and chairs and sat under the open windows and listened to the music. It was a different time. Now, the home was purchased by the town in 1943, and the hill was leveled. And originally, it was used as the town dump. <laughs> and then later, a skating rink was built. Later, <coughs> Dr. Norberg enlisted the help of the Winchester JCs to do a survey of 200 seniors who were 62 years or older. And they did this with face-to-face 45-minute -face interviews. Later, they did a mail survey with 400 letters. And they wanted to know what kind of help the seniors needed and who in the town would be able to offer the help. About half of these were actually filled out and returned. And the main need seniors had was isolation, and many were homebound. Now, later, in 1972, Reverend Jack Zorhide and Peggy Wells created a committee to do something about this. And they um, proposed a council on aging that would meet the needs of the growing senior population that was not being addressed by the town. The town meeting passed a resolution to support a, to create a Winchester Council on Aging. And this passed the town meeting, and the thing started. Now, the Council on Aging determined the need for space to meet for the seniors. The space was originally located in the Red Cross building across from Renton's Market on Church Street. 
Then they met in the Knights of Columbus building, which is now the Hope Christian Church. And then later, they moved to the Lincoln School balcony. One of my interests is, why did these people decide they wanted to do something to help seniors when they were themselves not seniors? The, um, Dick, they were all younger people, in particular Dick Norberg, who of course is still with us. Dick was motivated, he says, by joining the JCs and developing friendships that became a lifelong friendship. Mary Murphy was involved in those days, and she was interested in housing, affordable housing for seniors. And again, the state and local government didn't do much at that time. Now, in 1972, the seniors in town created a walk downtown. And here are some photos from that time. <laughs> there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them, and some of them, this picture doesn't show them all, but a lot of these people came on crutches, some came in wheelchairs. Anyway, they, their point was they wanted to have a meeting place for seniors. Here's some more of them. All right, this is where they were meeting after the, um, the Red Cross building. This was in Lincoln School where they had to climb up to the balcony. This was not easy for two reasons. One is there were, there were 18 steps that were not easy to navigate, but the bigger problem was they didn't have priority use of the space. So they would set up meeting, you know, individual appointments meetings, whatever, and then the teachers would show up and say, wait a minute, this is a school, this is our school, we own the space, you guys have to do something else while we use the balcony. So it was not exactly a place that was appropriate for seniors. The Senior Service Corps was set up at that time, and the, uh, the Council on Aging was set up at that time, and the um, the idea was there would be a process to help seniors. And the, um, eventually, the, the uh, senior association became, you know, started with a trust. And here talks about the trust. The idea of the center was to deal with people who were not necessarily 62 years or older. They could be 50, they could really be any age, but they were interested in it. They were interested in a, um, in a location that would enable them to meet in a quiet, private place. They discovered they would not be able to get funding from either the town or the Commonwealth, so they decided to do private fundraising, which I'm going to talk about in some more depth. There were three phases of the total construction. The opening of the center was in 1978. In 1987, there was a new wing that, as I remember, included this room that we're in. And in 2016, there was a Regenx addition that included the elevator and the second floor and lots of other things. Now, what was going on at that time? There was not affordable housing. There was a civil rights movement. And the Gray Panthers created an awareness across the country about senior issues. We talked a little bit about the need for private funding. One of the things that private funding would do would be to assure independence from town meeting and other and special interest groups so that the center could make decisions for the seniors by itself, you know, without being influenced by these other groups. Now, how did, how did James Jenks decide to put up money serious money for the center. Clarence Borgard decided to write a letter. Clarence had been writing letters for many years. <laughs> Some of you remember him. Clarence lived in my neighborhood, so I got to know him a little bit. He showed me his garden. He told me toward the end he wasn't able to cook anymore, but he still kept the garden going. He told me that um, it's important for everybody to exercise. His point was you either use it or lose it. He wanted to live through 
three centuries. He almost made it. He was born in 1899 and died in 1996. So he didn't quite make it. But he had an influence on this town that went beyond the senior center through writing letters and talking to people. He, um, he badgered the town meeting. He pointed out that if he could learn how to swim on Wedge Pond, why don't we come up with a beach for the current kids to learn how to swim? So now there is a beach named after him. The current town hall, uh, fire department, and police department were all redone because of his influence. And the senior center was a result of Clarence writing a letter and happening to run into James Jenks when James was walking to his car from his office downtown. He ran into Clarence, and Clarence showed him the letter before he had sent it to the Winchester Star. And Clarence then decided it was a good idea. Now this is Clarence with, surrounded by his family, and he's at the bottom of this letter. So Clarence showing the letter to James Jenks is what got Jenks to decide to come up with some serious money. All right, now Peggy is going to read an excerpt from Clarence's letter. I remember seeing Clarence's letters in the Star and also his participation in town meeting. And I think he was one that always adjourned the meeting. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, there is a pressing need for a place for, seeing, for people to gather. It, in the good old days, the many grocery, hardware, and other stores were built with flight of stairs uh, in front of their entrances. To do business, it was sometimes necessary for customers to no negotiate four or more high steps before they could get into the premises. Such stairs and steps were eliminated forever for the very good reason that merchants had become aware that a large and growing proportion of their potential customers were found to be in the upper age brackets, who do not like to climb stairs, and some who cannot climb them at all. I write this on my own initiative, but in the hope that I speak nevertheless for all of the mostly, roughly 2,700 people who are over 62 years of age in this town, and who members proportionate to the total population are growing yearly. On their behalf, I express this hope that something will be done soon to give us the senior citizens multi-purpose center that Winchester so badly needs. I write, therefore, to keep the need for such a new multi-purpose senior citizen center before the town residents. We want, we need, and there is no question that we deserve, at long last, a properly designed place where all senior citizens, firm or infirm, on foot or in wheelchairs, can be made welcome, where they will encounter no stare or obstruction whatsoever, and we will find rooms specially designed for the strict privacy demanded in cases involving personal problems or other confidential matters. After um, Clarence showed James Jenks the letter, James went and talked it over with his wife, Evelyn. And he suggested to Evelyn that he give the Seniors Association $250,000 to start the fundraising for the center. He said at the time it was, was his hope that any gift would stimulate others to get, also give so that what had been a dream for some years might become a reality. This, I think, is a very interesting quote. Each of us will be judged by our standard of life, not by our standard of living, by our measure of goodness, not by our measure of wealth, by our simple goodness, not by our seeming greatness. And he said that no contribu his contribution doesn't lessen the giving of others down to the smallest donation of a single dollar. Now, um, he also um, praised the group of the people working on this, young and old, um, who contribute time, money, talent, and all kinds of fundraising activities. Now, once his gift was made, 
things began to hum in, in earnest. The architect was chosen. There was, um, they held a groundbreaking. Now this is interesting. This was in December 1976. Okay, there's Dick Norberg, and to the right is James Jenks and Evelyn. Um, it was a clear day, but it was cold. So when they tried to, <laughs> when they tried to dig up the dirt, they couldn't. So there was some amusement that, uh, that James Jenks mentioned when he took up the spade. He says he found the ground so solid that he couldn't make a dent in it. Now, a friend who was a contractor, I don't know where this one is, came over and said, look here, Jenks, let me show you how to do it. And to everybody's further amusement, he was unable to crack the frozen ground also. <laughs> all right. Now, there were all kinds of other fundraising um, efforts that went on. And I'm going to highlight two of them that I found most interesting. In August of 1976, the JCs sponsored a concert in the high school of the University of California Berkeley football marching band. And at the end of the concert, the band members came into the parking lot and the people who came to the concert took them home individually and fed them dinner and gave them a place to sleep. Now this is personal to me because I went to school there. And I, I went to school there not that many years before this actually happened. And the idea that a football marching band from California came to Winchester to raise money for the Jenk Center is very interesting. The other interesting thing was, this was for a Christmas party in 1978. The Woburn District Court judge named Francis Cullen and the police lieutenant who's, uh, uh, and presiding officer named uh, Andrew Crawford donated $500 for the Jenks Christmas party in 1978. Where did they get the money? <laughs> okay. They went to a group of nonviolent um, offenders who each put in $50 in exchange for having their offenses removed from their records. <laughs> okay. And, um, and of course, they were nonviolent. And, and this was also a payment of their fines. So they raised $500 from the offenders. This shows the construction of the building in the wintertime. It was built in the wintertime, and there was snow inside while they were building it. And you can see from the amount of snow, it was not a small amount. OK, here's opening day. Now, there are three. There are several remarks that we're going to summarize for this opening day. The first one is from um, Reverend Jack Zorhai. Now, he wrote a long um, speech, and I'm just going to go through some of it. He said, here, a center of heart and hope formed by tireless builders of a dream, the creators, the workers, the givers, their meaning filled a nameless rush of days. Here, a vision of time and truth reaching back to a place before, now to grace this day tomorrow with the glad surprise of its generosity. Nor shall race nor creed tell our story, for here is a human quest bigger than single origin. Hereafter, excuse me, um, broader than our faith. Here is meaning beyond the fractious measurements of definitions. Here is the place of wholeness centered in the unity of compassion. Those around you, with you, tell the future's truth. They are the today that is also tomorrow. So look among you to find the meaning formed yet still forming, which is and yet will be here in this space. Okay, now James Jenks also said remarks. These are the remarks that were offered by James L. Jenks, 
perhaps then known affectionately, professionally, and with great support, Jimmy Jenks. However, here we go. When you were children, some of you may have chanted around this time of the year the old poem, quote, the spring has sprung, the grass has riz, I wonder where the birdies is, end quote. <laughs> Recently, I understand quite a few seniors have been reciting the same poem, only they end it with, I wonder where the seniors is. When I disclosed my plan to make a gift to the senior center, a block of sheer ecstasy, a look of sheer ecstasy, ecstasy came over Dick Norberg's face. <laughs> I did not realize it, realize it at the time, but I later learned that a senior center for Winchester had been a lifelong dream of Dick Norberg. And what is more amazing is that a man so young in years would care so much for the happiness and welfare of people twice his age. As Dick now felt that his dream could become a reality, he redoubled his activity. With the invaluable assistance of Larry Hutchings, plans went forward apace. I can never praise too highly the skill, devotion, and enthusiasm of this team. I doubt if there is a nail or a wire or any detail in that Dick and Larry do not know about and have paid for in blood, sweat, and tears. Certainly no words of mine can ever convey what a magnificent job they have done. I only hope they realize how grateful we all are to them and that their interest will not flag now that they have seen their work completed. Now, of course, any building as charming as this must be handsomely landscaped. We are fortunate that another dear friend of ours, Maurice Freeman, although a very busy man indeed, has more graciously expressed his willingness to supervise the planting of trees and shrubs and all outdoor decorations. He has already spent many hours in drawing up plans, and I can assure you that when the weather will permit, the surroundings of the Senior Center will be just as handsome as the interior we have now seen. And lest I be considered a male chauvinist, many charming and energetic ladies have done yeoman service on various committees, naming fairs and a, manning fairs, running fairs, I shouldn't say manning fairs, they're women, <laughs> running, ship, running fairs and a host of other jobs. Then there is our devoted decorator, Joanne Galvin. I doubt if anyone realizes the hundreds of miles this young lady has driven and the countless hours she has spent in search of decorations and furniture to make our senior center charming and livable. I would, however, like to manage one more reason why I felt it my duty and my privilege to lend financial encouragement to the project. I have been a resident of Winchester for over 30 years, and although I have voted faithfully on all town matters, I have never taken an active interest in town politics. This has not been from lack of interest, it is primarily because of my serious handicap of deafness. It would be utterly impossible for me to attend meetings and be able to follow the discussions. I do hope that whatever help the contributions Evelyn and I have made will in some measure pay our debt to the town we live in and love. Speaking of deafness, I was riding in a taxi recently and the driver noticed that I was wearing a hearing aid. Turning to me, he said, that thing you wear in your ear, does that help your hearing any? It's wonderful, I replied. I couldn't do without it. What kind is it, he asked. Quarter to four, I answered. <laughs> the driver was too polite to smile. Well, he said, we all have our troubles. Me, I'm blind as a bat. He had a sense of humor. Okay, in the early days, the most important thing that happened was a hotline that the seniors could connect with the people who were there to help them. Now, there were portraits unveiled, and the one on the right hangs in the lobby, 
And Dick Orberg, who will hopefully mention some of this later, made remarks at the unveiling of the portrait. This is Evelyn. And, and um, she was also very um, friendly to the Jank Center. Now, we had a few disasters. Some of you remember the blizzard of 1978. Many of the seniors in town were snowed in. Some of them couldn't open their front doors because they were iced. The people at the senior center decided they had to do something about it. They got permission from the police chief to be on the road. There was a statewide driving ban, you might remember. But the police chief said they could make deliveries to seniors who needed groceries, prescriptions, and other services. Well, Jackie Mill started doing it, but her car broke down. So Bono Ford gave free use of their rental car, and they were able to provide food and prescriptions and so on to many seniors, and the kids shoveled them out. So this was the beginning of you know, people helping each other. There was another disaster. On New Year's Eve in 1987, there was a cold snap the night before. The custodian, Richard Fiore, decided to come at 7 in the morning to make sure everything was OK. And he was surprised. There was no heat. The pipes were frozen. The water was gushing. The kitchen was flooded. The fixtures had fallen down from the ceiling. And any of you know the anxiety of calling a plumber an electrician and waiting for them to call you back, you can imagine what's going to happen if you have a party planned that night. Well, lo and behold, they, all, they called the departments in the town, the repairs were made, and the party happened on schedule. This is amazing. Now, there were several different expansions. Here's um, Dick Norberg and Evelyn Jenks and other people in the original expansion, cutting the ribbon. Okay, these were people that were involved in fundraising for the what we call the Ray Jenks expansion, which was the final one. This is some of the volunteers that make everything happen. And it's very amazing. They're motivated, and this is the way things get done. Now this is showing a group from the Jenks marching in the Inca Parade. So this still happens. All right, before I introduce our panel, I want to say two things. First of all, as you'd all know, the Jenk Center is not just for seniors. Nobody asked you to indicate your age when you came in tonight. Most of the programs are free of charge. Those who aren't have a very nominal cost. Uh, nobody asked you if you reside in Winchester. The center is open for people in, in various communities of various ages. And nobody asks any of these things. And to me, this is also important because the, it, it enables the services to be provided without all these kinds of uh, boundaries. Did the taxpayers pay for it? You know, that kind of thing. This is, uh, it, to me, this is, uh, it resonates with feelings about providing services to the greater area. And now with stuff being available online and various things, it's, it's fascinating. And to me, that's also very important. All right, now we open it up to our panel, who are going to come up here and, and answer your questions. <coughs> and they um, know this history much more than I do. Dick Norbert, Peggy and Jack Rawl, and Carol and Jim Kent. And I will give a microphone. Thank you, Rick. That was uh, very, very nice and interesting. I uh, spent a week thinking about the times that we've spent here over 40-ish years. And I look out at your faces and I realize it reminds me of uh, playing golf a little bit. Um, some of you may know that golf is a, is a game that's played in uh, 18 innings or chapters on 18 holes. And it's typical that you play the front nine, it's called, and then at the turn, you're heading to the back nine. And as I look out, I'm fairly confident that just about everyone in this room is on 
life's back nine, including myself, I will say that I have been blessed and honored and uncomfortable with being recognized. And I think any of you who know me realize that that's true. I'm here because I need to be here uh, over all this time, because these are important things in the community that Jane and I grew up in. And all of you in this room understand that giving back and helping out vitalizes each of you more. It's, it's better to be a giver than a receiver, and that adds interest and importance to our lives and validity, and it has all along, and it's as true today as it was 40 years ago, and it's um, easy to see. The enthusiasm of the pictures of people that are there. My blessing was to spend time with people like crazy Clarence and Leonor Rich and James L. Jenks, Jr. I could talk for an hour about Jim Jenks and his career uh, at the origins of the electronics world, working with important scientific people. Vannevar Bush was at his elbow in the creation of RCA and all of these kinds of things. And he was a very successful businessman. He had no children and it probably would not surprise you to know that I've asked him a half a dozen times to adopt me. But, it did, <laughs> but he was a very successful and a very bright businessman so he eschewed that but it was a great pleasure to spend time with him. I was fortunate because there's something about the timbre of my voice that was easier for him to understand than most other people. So I could sit with him in his home for hours as he regaled me with stories of famous people that he knew, the Paul Dudley White of Bass General, and the business that he created was called Sanborn. They made the very first electrocardiograph machines that were in existence. And he traveled to Japan and took electrocardiograms of whales uh, but with devices that were implanted with uh, harpoons. And uh, the stories would go on and on and on forever. So uh, my point is it was always a great pleasure for me to be dealing with any of these things as well as all of the people that are here who exemplify what the ideals that Rick tried to portray that Jim Jenks in his letter did, that the community that we live in is blessed by, just one example would be Carol Kent, at her own initiative, and invented something that had never been done before, probably 20 years ago. Carol decided that we should use this facility and have classes, um, do things that were a step different, a step up, lectures and classes, and brought in people who conducted sometimes four or eight week classes in a whole array of different kinds of things, and created by her energy the what became known as the Jenks Learning Connection. And it shows how one person with some initiative can team up with a bunch of other people and on we go. So those are parts of the backgrounds and some of the things that, that, that I would share with you that um, the blessings to me personally have far outweighed the time I have spent doing it. We have an opportunity to answer or uh, comment comments from any of you if you have questions and you want to understand um, what may have happened. Uh, just for one instance, we have a, a creation of different organizations that have been somewhat confusing to most people from the very beginning. James L. Jenks was a very bright businessman and he did not give us $250,000 without restrictions, you might assume. And there were significant restrictions. Among them is we had to raise an equal amount of money in the community in addition to his money. That was one. Number two, he needed to make sure that there was a tax exempt uh, experience for him. And it took us a year to acquire the satisfactory tax exemptions for his attorneys in it. Create, it, mean, it meant creating a tax-exempt organization, which is why the Winchester Seniors Association, Inc., was created and acquired its tax exemption. In addition to that, he said, I don't want to find out that 10 years from now, you're using this as a roller skating rink for renegade adolescents who uh, 
uh, and you use the building for a purpose that's different than what we've intended. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm grateful that you put my name on it. And um, so in order to ensure that, I need you to create a trust that owns title to the property. And the trust will exist until the death of the last original trustee. And that's what you're looking at. <laughs> so you have to be really suspicious. If I, if I disappear on the suspicious organization uh, uh, circumstances, um, the group has finally got to me. So James L. Jenks had those conditions. And um, uh, it shows that he was thoughtful. And um, I think he, he said many times to me afterward, he's given away a whole lot of money. And it was mentioned, too, about the Baptist Hospital and many, many other things in, in, in the city of Boston. He said to me, as legitimately as I can interpret anybody, the gift that he made that gave him the greatest happiness and satisfaction was this one. Questions? Comments? Jim? Uh, one of the things, uh, we're not, we don't go back in history anywhere near what Dick does. I mean, he was born here, and he grew up here, and he went to school here. And Carol and I, and I think uh, uh, Egg and, and uh, Jack also are newcomers, basically. He, and though, even though I'm a little older than uh, uh, Dick, uh, I'm a little younger as far as being uh, part of the Cenk Center. But anyway, Carol and I uh, uh, moved here in, uh, in 1963 and uh, raised five kids. And uh, in 1978, the furthest thing from my mind was a Jenks Center for seniors, <laughs> I tell you. <ya. laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, since that time, uh, we've both come to appreciate it so much. There's so many things going on here, uh, programs, uh, the activities, the classes, and we've all, both of us have gone to quite a few of these. But the most important thing from my standpoint was the opportunity to volunteer. And you saw all those people in that picture that were volunteering here. And uh, to me, that is really important because when I quit work, I had this, this uh, you know, bunch of time that I wasn't sure what I was going to do with. And I, I like golf, but not that much. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I, I, and Carol and I were doing some traveling at that time, and we enjoyed that very much. And I, we found out about the uh, trip to the Panama Canal, and we took that trip. It was the best trip I've ever been on. Uh, we flew to Barbados and got on a Crystal Cruise ship and went through the Panama Canal after stepping, stopping at a couple islands. We stopped on the others. West Coast for, for a couple of ports and then and, and, uh, ended up at Acapulco and flew home. And so the, the uh, group leader, and this was put on by the uh, travel committee at the Jenks, and the group leader on that time was uh, Bud Knopf, and I think probably some of you knew Bud. Uh, and I told him, I said, wow, that was, the best, that was the best trip I've ever been on. I really liked it. And he said, well, Jim, I think you'd enjoy being on the travel committee. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, come on on. Try it out. Come on the meeting. OK, so I did, and I joined the travel committee. And uh, actually, we put together quite a few trips. And uh, 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 Bill Kennedy, who was then the president, uh, took me aside and said, hey, why don't you run for the board? What's the board? <laughs> and he said, well, the board of directors, they operate the Jenk Center, and they set up all these activities and things. I think you'd really enjoy it. And so I said, well, OK, I could do that, I guess. And so after uh, about a year, Bill was uh, past president, and uh, Ken Astle was the president. And he said, why don't, or we about to become president, he said, Jim, why don't you uh, uh, run for vice president? I don't know about that. I don't know anything about running on a board of vice, as a vice president. So, but he said, well, I think you could do it. And so I figured I'd better find out something about how, what a board does, and particularly a nonprofit board. 
And so I uh, went down and took a couple of seminars and uh, some classes down in Boston from people who uh, knew about nonprofit boards. And I got a couple of brochures from the Attorney, Attorney General's office about what the responsibilities and, and, uh, and duties are of a nonprofit board of directors. And uh, so uh, the only problem is, and uh, while I was vice president, Ken took ill and ended up in the hospital for a year. So I was really, after about a year and a half or three years or whatever it was, I was president of this place that I didn't know much about at the particular time. But uh, we, learned, we learned a lot real fast. <laughs> And uh, I think that's about the time that uh, uh, I, I met, well, I met Jack before this, but Jack was also involved. And uh, he uh, was the chairman of the uh, uh, finance committee. And at that time, uh, uh, the finances were a little shaky. Uh, the endowment wasn't quite, well, it was just about enough to cover the added expenses uh, of the uh, center, operating expenses. So he said, hey, we got to do some planning. <laughs> and so, so uh, uh, he knew some uh, 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 ex-businessmen and executive corps. And so we set up, a, I think he set it up, set up a, uh, a group. And we put together a five-year strategic plan and, and uh, laid out a bunch of milestones and things like that. And uh, uh, got, the, got some goals for the finances and things like that. And so. Uh, so you never know, you know, you volunteer and you start on a journey and you don't know where that journey's going, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, I, but every, I, I really enjoyed it and I love working with Dick and, and all the other uh, people that are here. And even after uh, the presidency, which I enjoyed very much, uh, Carol and I are still hanging around. <laughs> So, are there any questions? Uh, we could all try to answer them. Yeah. What happens when the ice skaters used to stay here? <laughs> oh, you know, they, they took that down. When we first moved to town, uh, that ice skating rink was here. And uh, I, as I remember, I think our kids skated on it. But I, I don't remember I, who put it on. Do you know who? Uh, yes, I do. The, the photograph that you saw predated uh, Mr. Kent's. Uh, coming to Winchester. In fact, it predated mine. Um, years later, approximately 1965-ish, maybe, some of you may remember this, um, Rick Saltmarsh, who is one of the significant people in this community and has been for a lot of years, who had his own initiative and with no money, an ice skating rink on this property with foam boards all around it. It was not refrigerated, but it was a hockey rink. Uh, Rick <coughs> played hockey on a national championship college hockey team. I believe he served on that, uh, was in that position for two years. So he was a, a devoted advocate of the game. He built it, and that rink then, went, when it went out of use, uh, became the site. So the pictures that you saw were not the rink that, that you might be referring to. No. I'm not going to conjecture about that. I'm <laughs> going to before the reconstruction, it's even better now. Uh, and the thing that strikes me most, that, that I think is best, are the opportunities and the possibilities that people have down here. I don't know how many of you were able to come, but uh, last week or so, my neighbor, Andy Sarcina, uh, came down and gave a wonderful lecture to a packed house on her trip to the Antarctic, which was a fantastic trip. 
Well, she learned about that the year before. She had gone to a travelogue uh, that was organized by uh, Connie Stolo in a lecture series. She heard that and she thought, wow, that's something. I'd love to do that. So she saved her money and she put weights on her ankles and started walking around town to prepare herself. And she went all by herself and she came back with these marvelous pictures that she shared with all of us. And when I, I just shake my head when I think about, you know, how lucky we are that we have her, that she, that she had the opportunity to, to share with all of us. Most of what I've been involved with down here are the evening classes, the Jenks Learning Connection, and you give me much more credit than I deserve. I did not start the classes. My neighbor, uh, <laughs> Rosemary Sullivan would raise her eyebrows <laughs> if she, because she's the one who started them, but I helped her and uh, have been involved in it all the time. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch develop. We were concerned that we had this terrific building here that closed at 4.30 and was right in the middle of town. And at that hour, you could park out here, uh, even though it's difficult during the daytime. But uh, we thought it really should be used. And this was one thing that, that we decided to do. And the classes were really very, very successful. But what I like best about it, in, in addition to the classes, was the opportunities for the outreach from that. From the bridge classes that were here, I can't tell you how many small neighborhood bridge groups have developed from friends who've been friends for a long time from friends who just met each other, and they're still going. Uh, there was an Italian class that had dwindled to numbers that we could no longer support, but they didn't want to give up. So they kept on meeting with the teacher in their own home. Uh, and, and I must say, my favorite morning of the week is Thursday morning, because I was involved in an Irish short story class more than 10 years ago, I think. And uh, we still meet every Thursday morning at the teacher's, around the teacher's dining room table. And none of it would, none of us would miss it for the world. It's just, it's, it's been such a blessing in my life. And I know other people could tell the same stories. It's really great. So, I know change is not always comfortable. And sometimes it's hard to stick your toe into something that you uh, are not familiar with. And that's difficult, I think, the first time you come here. I remember when we first came, it was to, uh, it was, it was to a potluck dinner in the fall. Dr. McLean was taking the tickets. And, and I, at that point, I think it was in my last year of working, and I thought, well, oh, you know, this is very nice. I don't know if I'm quite ready for this. Well, I very soon was ready for it. And I can't tell you how happy I am that we're involved in this wonderful, wonderful place. And that you all, too. Thanks for coming. I can attest she doesn't miss that class on Thursday morning ever for any <laughs> Oh, Are we on? Um, Peggy and I moved to Winchester from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1977. And that was roughly when the Jenks Senior Center was taking shape. And over those first few years in Winchester, we became more comfortable, more knowledgeable, and more engaged with all things local. And for us and for our, our children, this was an educational experience by total immersion. Peggy and I both had new jobs. We had five children ranging from the third or fourth grade up to senior in high school. Then we had to watch them get on, apply for and get on into college. So we were pretty well tied up. But we gradually got involved with the community and with the Jinx. Now looking back on our 41 years of residence here in the community, many opportunities have been presented to us to become active locally. And to the best of our ability and our time and our resources, we have responded. And high on the list, of course, is the Jenks Center, the Jenks Senior Center, or more affectionately, the Jenks. We have responded 
to those requests for support and participation with the Jenks. It's our Jenks. Looking back, my only formal, <clears throat> formal position with the Jenks has been chairman of the Winchester Senior Association Finance Committee. And I was chairman of that for maybe two or three years, about 20 years ago, maybe more. I was also helpful to get the executive service engaged out here. Um, some of you may remember another consultant named, uh, another uh, member here uh, named Steve Lewis. Steve and I were both members and consultants with Executive Service Corps, and when we worked together to get the Jenks engaged as a client of the Executive Service Corps for a planning exercise, Steve continued on that team, and I moved on to something else. Winchester is a very special community in large measure because of the many local nonprofit organizations that operate here. Among those nonprofit organizations, of course, is our Jenks Center. Now, I had hoped to get Amazon engaged and ship maybe six cases of wine in here for this group, but uh, it, just, it just didn't work out. Um, but let us figuratively raise our glass and offer a toast to the town of Winchester and to our Jenks Center with its many opportunities for productive and rewarding community service. For our Jenks, within which we and you, individually and collectively, have offered your presence, your commitment, and your financial support. Yeah. Amen. My involvement with the Jenks began in 1996 when Ernest Hicken asked if I would be a volunteer driver. I continue to drive people to their appointments today. Through this I have met many wonderful people, those that drive, those that I work with at the Jenks, as well as other drivers. A few years ago I headed up a hospitality committee which put on parties at the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day. We would prepare the lunches the day before and arrange for entertainment. The first lunches came at a cost of $4 per person and were served with the help of a wonderful group of men. I also became involved in writing letters to ask for donations to the center to help with operating costs. We wrote personal notes on hundreds of letters. I've enjoyed working with volunteers and staff here at the Jenks Center and have made lifelong friends. In addition, attending many concerts, plays, lectures, and events through the years has provided many years of entertainment and enjoyment. The Jenks Center has played a big role in my life in Winchester. And I have one other little anecdote, and it is that I uh, visit a woman who has turned 100 years old. Her name is Sandy Alla, and she has played the piano here for many different events and uh, is still doing very well today. But she told me that uh, she had been secretary to Jimmy Jenks. And when she first heard of the idea, she went to visit him and uh, she said to him, well, what if I don't like this job? And he said, well, I might not like you either. <laughs> And the two of them got along famously, and when Jimmy was gone, she uh, continued on uh, to help and work with Evelyn. But I think that's a special story. <laughs> I'm on the position of the caboose. We're uh, finished with our remarks. There are some questions. Um, I will make one comment about the trust. Mr. Jenks' comments, uh, her restriction was that the trust would exist at least until the uh, passing of the last original trustee. And what happened? Then it's closed. I'm sorry. How did it go on after that? Uh, there are new trustees, uh, successor trustees have been appointed, so there are currently nine different people who are trustees, and all of whom are uh, younger, brighter, and more interesting than I by far. <laughs> so. Uh, does anyone else have a comment or a question? I'm new here. What happened to the original starting mansion? How did you acquire the land? 
The land was purchased by the town of Winchester. The mansion was destroyed. The hillside that it was on was used to fill the big bog. Years ago, there was no road here. If you came down by Winchester Tennis Courts to the intersection where Main Street is, you couldn't go further because it was a swamp. So that land was changed and, and altered by filling. And uh, so time marches on. That, but, but yes, the town bought the land. And anybody else? Hello. Hello. I just heard, you said the Irish short stories class is Thursday morning. Is that uh, what you said? Is that the time? Uh, I don't. I don't think she said Irish uh, short stories. Oh, it wasn't I think you just have selective hearing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We discriminate in this place. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say I don't think the Irish are capable of a short story. <laughs> Well said. That reminds me of a comment my friend Paul Collins made at the indoctrination of uh, Helen Babcock. And uh, he made a comment about that. He said, an Irishman is morose until he is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a, a bit of a wrap up for you and then say, let's go to dinner. But um, when you look at the pictures of the volunteers that are here and you see these people, and, and I look at all of you, um, you are participating in something that has, I think you all will agree, high value and importance in the community. And it, it is people like you in this room and those who preceded you for years after years have created an identity that Jack Roll calls the Jenks. Because of the way those people here in the room and all who preceded you have behaved and acted in the community, in the region, you've earned the respect and the admiration of many, the town officials, the town government, the businesses, and all of the people who support, because they now understand what is Jenks. It is not just a building. It is all of the things and all of the personal relationships and all of the extending out to be part of something to give a hand to other people. The, so from my point of view, the most valuable thing about the Jenks isn't the beautiful building, although people come from all over the place to look at it and marvel and say, oh my goodness, this is a privately owned facility. What a blessing it is to the town of Winchester, and it is. But the most important thing and the most valuable thing about the Jenks is what I call a franchise. The Jenks is known for something, and it's known for all of the good things that you do. And it is not uh, short stories, Irish or otherwise. It is not bridge. It is not, it's the sum of all of those things. But significantly, and maybe more importantly, this is the place where the Council on Aging and its staff of professional people reach out into the community and deal with the difficult, hard needs that we all uh, don't see or we fail to see and you cannot understand unless you've been here and see what these people are doing What the older community and the families of the older people many of whom may live in some godforsaken Oshkosh wherever that is and their and their elders are here and the staff that provides needed social services live in this building and and we are deservedly proud that they are here so don't get faked out into thinking this is just a recreation facility. It's marvelous because it offers opportunities for old people like me that sometimes feel a little alienated with the crazy careening culture that we're in the middle of. But now this is a, a, a place of stability. I come in here often every day and sit and have coffee with people even older than I and have wonderful chit chats. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, something we all should be proud of. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you again to Rick of all the work you did for this presentation. Thank you very much to the panel. I think you really brought humanity to a, bring a nice story and what the center means to you. I know um, all the staff are very happy to come here every day and we're very thankful that we work at the Jags and I think uh, it, as a brand, it is, but I think, Dick, you summed it up very well. It's about a lot of people and the interactions and the capabilities it has to be, provide meeting 
and we thank you for coming tonight and we hope to see you tomorrow.